And one of them is, uh, okay. is writing the defense for the Club Aposito uh, on behalf of Padre Aquino as he is being considered for canonization. So that, that's so we invite you to that. And so uh, I just want to ask you to take whatever information you can you would like if there is a law for your, uh, your use. Uh, this is uh, Jim Turner. He's, uh, he's a retired uh, uh, historian and worked at the Arizona Historical Society and now he's a freelancer, a teacher, a researcher, an uh, author, and I think also a tour guide. Whatever, whatever. whatever they want you to be. You got it. Uh, he's a long, long time historian. He's been here since uh, 51 and he attended the University of Arizona where he got his master's degree in U.S. history in 1999, and uh, Jim just recently finished a book, a pictorial book, called Celebrate Arizona, and that's coming out in October of this year, and uh, he also does a, a monthly column in the Citizen of uh, Arizona Daily Star uh, under the Life in the Old Pueblo. So at this point, I'd like to introduce Jim Turner. Saturday. Uh, I understand there's also a tour today, so um, I'm glad that you are more interested in Kino the Scholar than uh, Kino the Traveler. And that's kind of pretty much what I'm going to be talking about. I felt that I would be preaching to the choir today. Um, obviously, you know and love Kino already, or you wouldn't come to hear more, but there are the books. Father Charles Polzer is kind of the definitive expert, so if you've read Polzer, you probably know as much about Kino. So I thought I'd better go get some extra little things, some things to ponder. And as I was going through the books, and there are a stack of books on, on Kino in the U of A library, I found that there were a lot of things about he did this, he did this, he did this. And of course, when we had the statue dedication, there were marvelous speakers um, talking about the, the beef and the wheat and uh, all of the contributions that Kino meant, made and the dates that he was at this mission or the dates that he was founding that mission or traveling on this particular date. But they are mostly scholarly chronologies of this happened, and this happened, and this happened. And you don't really get a feeling for Kino, the person. What was his personality? And so I, was, I just happened to have lunch with Big Jim Griffith on, on Thursday. And I said, Jim, what do you know about Kino, the person? And he said, well, gee, he sort of got this dumbfounded look. He really hadn't thought of it that way. And I think a lot of people that have written the books are pretty much the same way. They, they are focused on all of the stuff that Kino did. And you can be overwhelmed by um, the amount of things that he did, the distances that he traveled, the number of missions that he founded, the number of people that he baptized, and sort of lose who Kino is. And yet, that's part of Kino. The, the hustle and the bustle and the type A personality we call it today, <laughs> where he's always busy, he's always moving, that's the Kino personality. But before that, there's a lot of things that, that get repeated from one book to another. From Bolton on, um, things get, get published and then they, they get picked up. Scholars can be lazy. And we would rather go to an established work okay. than go back to the original paper. And, you know, most of us can't afford to go to Italy, which was then Austria, and, and look at the records or look at the family members and say, okay, now I know that what Polzer wrote was true or what Bolton wrote was true. So we just pick those things up and repeat them and repeat them. And we had this happen. Uh, just a few weeks ago, I was writing a column for the Daily Star about Kino, and I got a call from uh, Maria Parham, the editor, saying, he, uh, what was Kino's, you know, and this is last minute, they, they're always on a deadline at the newspaper. Get back to me right away. Tell me what day Kino
Dino was born. <laughs> and now, of course, August 10th, you know, it's off the top of my head because we're just eating and sleeping and drinking Kino this month. <laughs> but at that point, it took me a while. It just took me a second to get it. And I call back. Of course, his phone is busy because she's <laughs> calling somebody else to ask Kino's the day that he was born. And uh, so by the time I got through, she said, yes, I got it. It was really, really easy to find. But, um, earlier writers do not know that. In 1916, there's, there's a seven volume of Arizona history that says we don't know what year he was born. So, you know, more scholarship, more scholarship. But her point was, born in 1816. Uh, I do a lot of different history. <laughs> born in 1645 and died in 1711. So everybody says he was 66 when he died. And it's in the books that he was 66. And the editor, who is used to writing obituaries, of course, made the point, and everybody's out here doing the math now, um, he was born in August, he died in March, he was 65. So now we've got to go back and change all the books. <laughs> What historians do is we just take the year he was born, subtract it from the year he died, and we don't think about it. Reporters, on the other hand, they've got to write an obituary. They have to have the right number. So there's stuff out there that um, just gets repeated. And it's a little thing, I know, but um, those things kind of add up. So this is kind of a re-examination. And other things get kind of slid over, you might say. They're kind of um, glossed over. And you know, the fact that he's an astronomer and a mathematician, we're always, it's always in the, the short biography and the introduction to many books. But nobody stops and says, well, what does that mean? Oh, yeah, before he came to Arizona and did the famous stuff in Arizona, which is all we're interested in, let's face it. Um, if it happened outside of Arizona, it's not important. But 13 years he spent as a scholar. He, he joined the Society of Jesuits when he was 20 and then had to do another 13 years. Now, much of that was philosophy and theology, which is what Jesuits do. They usually wind up with three PhD degrees. Um, and Kino did that. Now, what is the personality of a scholar? What is the personality of a mathematician? Um, that gives you the insight. Now, I worked as a secretary in the chemistry department while I was working my way through grad school. And they sure showed me that stereotypes are not true. You know, there were a lot of professors that not only were excellent in chemistry, but also um, they knew all the poems of Robert Frost, or they were um, award-winning crossword puzzle experts, or what have you. So the idea of a scientist being that mad scientist type guy with the crazy hair and, and uh, and stacks of books and dirty test tubes or whatever. Not true, but the focus of a mathematician, the attention, the keen intellect of a mathematician, that's something that we can say. And this is Kino's career until he's 36 years old. So it's a completely, we just so, by the way, he was, before he was a missionary, he had this other career, not just that he, did a couple of years while he was waiting to get on the ship. Um, he was a mathematician and, and an astronomer. And uh, he turned down a professorship, and I believe it was at Ingolstadt, but he also taught in Munich. And see, I told you I was preaching to the choir. Just when he nods, you know, and, you know I got it. <laughs> if, if I don't have it, Shake your head. I'll ask you the right answer. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, so he turned down a professorship because when he was young, he had some sort of deadly illness and he prayed to St. Francis Xavier, if you get me out of this one, I will dedicate my life to the mission service. And so by age 20, he had decided to do that. And all of the scholarship, all the math went by the wayside. So here is a man who chose faith over science. 
And I think that is the personality that we're also looking at. This is another interpretation of, and some of the books, especially written in the 50s and 60s, will romanticize. They'll put words in Kino's mind and thoughts in his, his head and that sort of thing. Historians, we don't do that as much anymore. We don't try to give him noble thoughts. But if the actions are there, and we can say this is probably what, um, and by his actions, choosing the mission life over and turning down the job, pretty well can say we know where his head was at without putting any thoughts in his mind. If he turned down the professorship, um, he must have thought this was more important to become a missionary. Um, another thing that kind of gets mentioned, and not in all the not in all the books, he had a relative. Oh, and we don't know what the disease was. So somebody, please, that wants to be a Kino scholar, <laughs> what the heck did he have? Um, that drives me crazy. I need to know those details. And I don't know what I'm going to do with it afterwards, but it just bothers me. And I'll tell you, an editor will ask you that kind of, you turn a story that says he had a, a deadly disease, you're going to get back a red crayon around it and find out what this was. So if you, if you know, please tell me afterwards. But I don't think you do, because nobody seems to know, even the experts. But he also, he had a relative. And again, we don't know what the relation was. Some say uncle, second cousin, named uh, Martin Martini. And Martin Martini was a missionary to China. And he had a fascinating career in that Jesuits quite often, well, they almost always became teachers, but they didn't limit themselves to the lowest indigenous class. When they came to a country, they also worked with the leaders. And Martini became a Mandarin. He worked with the, the highest ruling class of China. And there are portraits of him in his silks and in his...